So in that moment, I thought I have to learn how to video edit and I have six hours before I need to put this on YouTube. And so I was like, how do you video edit with iMovie typing that into Google and like watching YouTube and figuring out how to cut that piece out. Last week, our worship service marked a year since we left our building. It was a somber service befitting the moment. And this week, we're going to continue to mark that anniversary and the, the one year anniversary of our first online service, but we'll do it in a slightly different way. Over the last two weeks, I've been meeting with staff and lay leadership at the church, recording conversations about just what it's been like working for a church in the midst of a global pandemic. You know, and partly that's been a way to mark the anniversary and, and to mark this time. But it's also an attempt to get down what journalism calls the first rough draft of history, to tell the story about what this has been like. The interviews are going to be available in full on YouTube. They should be uploaded uh, by the time this service ends. But in lieu of a sermon today, we're going to play excerpts from them. I hope as you watch them that they give you some sense of what it's been like on the other side of this camera. There we go. Um, so as we start out, uh, for folks who, who may not know you yet, uh, could you introduce yourself and your pronouns and what position you have at the church? Yeah, my name is Chelsea Krafka, she, her, hers, and I'm the director of religious education. My name is Jean Helms. I'm the administrative director for the Unitarian Church, and my pronouns are she and they. I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, since 2017, I have served as the minister of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. All right. I am Trevor Jones. I am he, him, and I am president of the Board of Trustees. Okay. Well, my name is Kelly Ross. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the member and admin coordinator, which means that I help out in the office and I love to welcome new people to the church and help develop uh, members as well. So uh, when we started last March, how we were recording these uh, the ser Sunday services was we would all join a Zoom call and then we would press record. And so essentially it was live for us. So if any, if there was any mistakes or anything, it just was in the service. So it was very real and very organic. And I was learning how to be the Zoom host for all of that and manage all the back end. So it would look good when we would um, premiere it on Sundays. Well, there is one Sunday where I hit the wrong button. And when the hymn was playing, usually all of us would kind of sit back, take a breather, get ready for like the next part. And I accidentally had all of our videos showing during a hymn. And so all of us looked just checked out because we were like mentally preparing for the next part of the video that would be recorded. And like some of us were just like kind of sleeping on our hands. Some of us were drinking coffee, you know, it, it was not going to fit in the service. So we had all recorded live. I finished, I was watching it back and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, I can't ask everyone to re-record this entire service. So in that moment, I thought I have to learn how to video edit and I have six hours before I need to put this on YouTube. And so I was like, how do you video edit with iMovie, typing that into Google and like watching YouTube and figuring out how to cut that piece out. And that is what started us being able to provide more streamlined services. Um, the content has, hopefully everyone has seen that the quality has gone up um, and it was all from that moment. And that kind of describes the year to me where, where things happen and we think, oh no, I don't know how to do this, but I have to learn how to do this right now to make this work. And that's what the whole year has been like. So we've all grown, but there have been some pain points there. What, uh, what do you remember of like that, that wild week a year ago? Um, Cause you were the, you were the other person on the Zoom call. 
with me on the second week of March as we were trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the just the crazy uncertainty of not knowing exactly what we were dealing with and how serious it was. And I mean, it's hard to remember now, but that was like, that was even before masks or before we even thought about masks or any of those things. So it's like, what is safe to do? What is, what is not safe to do? Uh, and we sort of went through at the church, we went through this thing where it was coming and then we were not shaking hands, but we were still doing service. And then suddenly uh, everything, you know, sort of happened all of a sudden. And I was, I was in DC uh, at a meeting when all that stuff happened and I was actually lobbying at the Capitol and they, they shut everything down. They, they made us leave. And then, um, and then I was on calls with you like <laughs> immediately after that. So I was, it was intense. It was a really um, unclear experience uh, exactly what we were dealing with and how long it was going to be. And so part of that, I think the thing about it is like looking back, you think, well, uh, clearly, you know, we should have had these longer term plans and maybe we should have thought about this or we thought about that, but we were just dealing with um, crisis management in those first days. Like well, this is, this could be uh, a couple of weeks. We didn't, we didn't know. And so that was the, the big thing we did on the fly. Um, and I know one of your questions is, you know, what are, you know, what are we do well. And I have to say, that's one of the things that I think is really uh, a huge tribute to the staff of our organization, you and the entire team is how quickly we pivoted to doing online services. And that's grown. I mean, that suite of experience has grown over the, of the year, but we moved really quickly into doing that. And that was, um, that was pretty amazing considering that, that uh, we didn't really know how long we were doing it for, what the scope of this was going to be, what the impact, how people were going to be accessed, whether or not we'd get back into the building, you know, partially or, and it turned out, you know, not at all. So um, yeah, chaos, uncertainty. Yeah. No, it was, it was a wild week. Cause our, um, our president that year, you were serving as vice president, Emily Sh Cameron Shatil was serving as president and she was on vacation overseas and you were in dc mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was nuts <laughs> so we had all the early consultations on zoom not because we were not meeting in person but because we were we were spread out if i remember right as a whole. yeah i've been thinking about this a little bit we we had a um uh, an event around the 150th where we got together in groups over zoom and different people spoke and different members of the staff kind of helped host um, and there were some crossed wires. There was some miscommunication about breakout rooms and things like that. And um, that, my point is it wasn't smooth sailing, but regardless of that fact, we were able to uh, get things smoothed out, have the conversation that we were meant to have uh, and things went smoothly from there. And I think that's a really good microcosm of the entire year in that nothing has been perfect, but everything has achieved what we set out to achieve. Um, it, it may have been a bumpy ride, but we did get information out to people. We did have services. We did have music. We did have conversations. And so uh, I, for me, I think that's, that's the event that kind of, it gave me a lot more hope for how the year was going to, to progress. If we had to keep staying online, people were really adaptable. But the, the thing that really stands out, if I had to name one moment, it would probably be that moment uh, where you're trying to record a one minute video for a, for a service and it gets interrupted at least five times. Um, I've had to learn to build in extra time for those things because inevitably if I start recording, the doorbell will ring and then the dog will start barking and then someone in the family will open the door of the office where I'm trying to record. Um, and, and that's not even counting the number of times that I have mispronounced someone's name or stumbled over my words. And I just think the blooper reel is gonna be potentially pretty long. Yeah, um, besides my cat jumping into my lap during a Zoom interview meeting unexpectedly um, and tech issues right before we started. <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> that, that sums things up pretty well. Um, I just had a naked toddler that came running behind the screen. That would also be fitting. 
Um, <laughs> so this last Sunday was really just, <laughs> it was so perfect. It was so perfect in the craziest of ways. Um, so I'm going to call out Heather Fox publicly um, because she was just incredible. She was teaching our Sunday school program that we do um, at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And um, so to start, she, she was filling in for somebody who was unable to make it. So she was a sub that day who popped in um, you know, the day before, which is great. But, you know, this happens just like it does in real life. Uh, she seemingly started off with this great plan uh, with a book about our hearts and she was ready to go. Uh, briefly, the book wasn't showing on her screen as she was trying to share her screen. And I mentioned that to her while she kind of navigated the tech for a minute. Um, and as that was happening, the children suddenly got really excited about show and tell. And so the lesson just took a different direction. <laughs> and it was really very Montessori-esque philosophy where um, Heather just decided to follow the child. It, it was what the kids needed that day. She just put the book on the back burner. I'm hoping she'll use it for another lesson because it looked like a great book. Um, but it was a rainy day. It was after spring break. It was the day of daylight savings time. And we had a record number of children attend. Um, <laughs> I thought that we would maybe have less children than usual, but we had 17, 18 at one point. Wow. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I was laughing and smiling so much that my eyes wouldn't stop watering for a minute and my face was kind of hurting. And Heather just totally rolled with the changes and she is so thoughtful and so considerate and just an amazing teacher. Um, so a moment that kind of encapsulated what this last year has been. I have to say one of the moments that, that for me, that's like the, the super emotional moment was the first time that the choir did the, the virtual song and everybody's faces were, were up there on the screen and I was watching at home. And for me, that was a truly emotional moment because I hadn't seen so many of those people for, for a long time. And it really made me feel connected uh, and excited to see, you know, those are my people. Uh, and that was, that was a very, very cool thing to be able to see. It's hard. <laughs> this whole year has been hard. Um, I think that one of the things that I have really missed and where we've fallen short is getting everyone like in the room at once, you know, like that, that notion of like everybody sitting in the sanctuary, right? Um, I would have loved to see everyone's faces on Zoom at some point. I know that that's clearly not possible, whether that's the tech issues or scheduled, everyone participating at the same time. Um, I think that we get close with our YouTube services on Sunday mornings with the live chat, um, but not everyone participates in the chat box option. We clearly don't see faces during that time. Um, and it's just a combination of things, right? So it's, mm. I don't think it's anybody's fault. It's just that there's, different needs from the different members of the congregation. There's certain capacity with tech, certain capacity with the staff, different schedules that everybody has. And we can't possibly replicate the exact same thing. We can't do church, but just put it online. Like there's no way to like do that a hundred percent. So I don't think that we've fallen short for lack of trying. Um, I don't think it's, the church or the staff or that our members have fallen short. I think that we've just fallen short because it's a pandemic and it's not anyone's fault. They talk about two different kinds of um, challenges. They talk about technical challenges and adaptive challenges. And technical challenges are ones that might be difficult, but they have a, a discrete fix that once you figure it out, you can, you can fix the problem and make it better and move on to the next problem. Adaptive challenges are um, bigger issues of culture change over time with a whole lot of variables going into them. And we've had a lot of both <laughs> in the last year. Um, but, but to take two examples, uh, a really pretty straightforward technical challenge for us is, has, been the, um, has been the technology piece of it. And actually, Stacey, you and I were talking about this the other night. Um, 
that in a lot of ways we're, we are trying to present um, a, 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 an experience that is uh, at a professional level using consumer grade equipment and nobody that's professionally equipped to do uh, deep video and audio work. Um, we have we have no audiovisual prof professionals on staff, or at least we didn't a year ago. I think we could probably call several of our staff members audiovisual professionals at this point. Um, but that's a technical challenge, right? Those are those are skills and tools that we've had to to pick up, and we can tell pretty well when we're doing it well, and we can tell really well uh, when we've done it poorly. The adaptive challenge has been more just how to hold the congregation together as a community. And that's harder because there are some times that I think we've done it really well. And there are some times where I worry that we haven't. Um, and it's really hard to get feedback on, on when we have or when we haven't. Um, a, lot, uh, a lot of the challenge for me is that I really, I, I miss the receiving line. Like when, when I'm... <laughs> When we're in the church in the receiving line, I can see 150 people file out of the sanctuary and tell what the mood of the congregation is, right? I can tell if things are going well, if there's something bubbling under the surface that I haven't quite heard yet. And that feedback loop doesn't really exist right now. Um, you know, I, I get emails when people are either at a 10 or a one, but I, I miss all the like two to nine feedback. <laughs> um, and that's hard. And that, that makes it hard to, to get ahead of, of this challenge of being a community. So I think we've all felt the barrier that technology can be. So when we went virtual so suddenly, it was very alienating to a lot of people who um, we're comfortable doing things in person. And so I wish, like if we could do it again, I wish we would have had opportunities to do in-person trainings, which would have been very last minute and, you know, um, probably not really well put together, but I wish we could have had that in-person training. This is how you get on Zoom before I had to start recording videos and hope that people could access those. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was I was at the church um, yesterday. I was down in the archives for the first time in forever, um, and I found like on the ground one of the one-page printouts we made that last oh week we were in the building of like how do you get on Zoom? Yeah, um, yeah. There's been a lot of moments. I think I think one of the enduring sort of sense feelings or mem uh, sense memories feeling memories is, is going to be staring at uh, an email on this screen and wishing I could be with the person on the other side of that email, either to celebrate with them or to, to mourn for them, but just to be physically present. I mean, that's such, such an enormous part of ministry is when you have nothing to say, just shut up and sit there. And, and make your presence known, even if there aren't words. Um, that super doesn't translate to email. It just, <laughs> silence on an email chain just looks like you're, you're not there. Um, so that, will, that, that one will endure for me as a memory. There's no like one moment that I, I can point to or, or want to in a video for worship, but, um, but that's one. Two things. I mean, this is the, the good and the, the bad, right? As like, so part of, part of the, the wonder for me about this is realizing just how much more we are than a building. I mean, just how connected in a lot of ways we've been able to become 
uh, and to remain engaged. And I think that that's a, a great success. I mean, one of the things that thrills me more about being president than anything else during this time is getting those reports of all of those social groups that are still meeting uh, online, the, the online games that people have played together, all of those things that they have done, all of these groups, dozens and dozens of things that have happened in the church. And I think that that you know, that is a great joy uh, for that access that we've been able to provide. But also, I acknowledge that that doesn't work for everybody. And that some people, uh, this, you know, the in-person contact is is the thing that they absolutely miss. And the, the virtual has not been able to replicate for them, that for them. And, and you know, no matter what, what we've tried, and we've tried many things, that that's just not going to be it. And that there is real value to being together as a physical community as well. And so the church is not a building, but the building is also very important. And so, you know, those are the two two sides of it for me. It's 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 been great what we've been able to do and it's been really really hard what we've been unable to do to keep people connected and engaged. So, uh, yeah, both sides of that um, have been have been challenging. I, if I was going to say uh, on, on a really technical level, I think we've gotten really, really good at this online thing. We've gotten very streamlined and putting it together and saying, you know, what is the format of the service? What are the hymns going to be? Who's going to do this part? Who's going to do that part? We've managed to incorporate a lot of extras, uh, the one fiftieth stuff. Um, it, it's, Early on, it was kind of formulaic, and, it, and it's become a lot more like a real Sunday service where if something comes up on a Friday, it's not an emergency to, to put that in for Sunday. So the adaptability, I think, has been, been really, really successful in, in getting everything we need to get out out there to people in a way that's pleasing to look at. <laughs> you know, it, every service could be 10 YouTube videos you know, here's the intro, click on the next one, here's the hymn. And I think we've done a really good job of making it palatable for people who would much rather be in the building. Right. One of the things that I'm, I really love is all the stuff that we've learned that will allow us to do services going forward in new and exciting ways and to create the the, the hybrid service, the service that you can go to uh, if you're, you're, in Lincoln and, and you're available, but, but the service that you can also attend virtually, you know, years from now, uh, you know, if you're on vacation or if you have a cold and you don't want to share it with somebody or whatever, like the, the level of access that we can provide to people uh, to our offerings is just really great. And I don't see that changing. I, I see that really that demand um, for, um, you know, being able to do things in person and a combination of virtual is great. I have to say that I see us having a lot of committee meetings via Zoom, even if we can get together, because it is, you know, uh, I know we're all sick of this, but there is a delight to be able to say, I have a committee meeting that starts in two minutes. Uh, and just to, to be able to not worry about driving to the church or getting your, finding your coat or are the roads icy? You just, you know, just go down. I, I'm in my basement most of the time and I'm just like, I could just go down in the basement and have a meeting. So that I see that as, as a, um, a, a real success for the future in terms of um, being able to do the work of the church. Yeah. I mean, I, for a church as a whole, I think that there have been a, a few things like I'm, I'm so excited to see that there have been a number of people that signed up for beloved conversations. I think that hanging our black lives matter banner and um, soon to be rainbow banner are huge successes being visible with our beliefs to the community. I think that's amazing. Um, in my area, I think that a success has just been that there have been so many choices, so many options, different ways for families to plug in. Um, you know, kind of talking about that, everyone in the same room not being possible um, with families, especially being so ridiculously busy and having different needs. A success has just been the ability to use technology and use this opportunity to offer so many different options. And so with 
RGL right now, like we're doing our online Sunday school, we're doing coming of age for middle and high school. We're offering Sunday school in a bag that is delivered to homes. Um, I'm doing emails that go out with resources each week so that families can do things at home on their own time. I'm recording stories each week. Um, there's ways to get to the church and participate in all ages activities. Like we're gonna do this Easter egg on paper hunt that's coming up um, in the next week or so. Um, so, you know, there's just different ways to plug in in one way or another. So, you know, I see families that have signed up for Sunday school in a bag, but I have not seen them online in any capacity at all, but they're willing to get a paper bag full of activities delivered to their home. This, I, I'm really grateful that I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. I feel like our community has really come together in supporting each other. I feel like the Unitarian Church has um, rallied to support people in our community, whether or not they were directly um, a member or a friend of the church. And that is something to be proud of. Um, this community has come out in support of others in the community in ways that I would not have imagined. Um, and, and I, you know, I had, you know, given some thought to that. Um, I didn't know that it would be in the form of a pandemic, um, but I, you know, I have thought about what would happen if we had a collapse of our economy or some kind of major event happen and, and would we be able to rally and support each other? And I think we've proven that we really can do that and that um, there's a lot of kind giving people in this community. The work and flexibility of the church's leadership. This is the the staff whom the church pays as as leaders have all gotten handed jobs, tasks, portfolios vastly outside their job descriptions. They're not even approaching what they thought they were gonna do a year ago. Um, and and if, I recall, if I recall, you have some pretty strong opinions on that. Um, as a matter of course, <laughs> I do. I do. I was. I'm actually of the of the management school that one should never give a task that's not in a job description. So this year has been particularly <laughs> neurosis inducing for me um, on that. Um, but um, the whole staff. I mean, Jean, Chelsea, Bob, Kelly have all all gotten handed these things and and run with them. Um, likewise, the, the board and program council have all learned new ways to meet, new ways to make decisions, new ways to handle congregational meetings, new ways to look at our budget, um, new ways of conceptualizing what, what it means to be uh, a church in the midst of a pandemic when we don't have a building. I mean, that's... <laughs> Providing pastoral care? Yeah. Oh, yes, we've learned a whole new language of pastoral care. Um, and that's that's really been a remarkable thing to watch. Um, and that's not to say it's we haven't argued and we haven't had moments of tension and difficulty, but it's one of those things where if, if we got through a year of a global pandemic and within the leadership team didn't have moments where we were arguing and having tension and difficulty, be asking what we were doing wrong because we clearly <laughs> wouldn't be putting enough of ourselves into the work uh, if we were all just kind of getting along all the time. So it's really, it's been remarkable to, to work with that group of people um, and, and to, to really be inspired by their work every day. I applaud every single member and friend of the church who connected with us online in any way, even once this past year, uh, because there was a huge learning curve for all of us. And I think taking the chance and the time to figure it out, to connect in a way that might not fully satisfy um, what you're looking for, it takes a lot of optimism, it takes a lot of hope, it takes a lot of faith. And I think all of us as staff saw that, even if you logged on once, and it, it meant a lot. And so I think how all of us really uh, stuck together and dug down deep in order to figure out how to survive 
through this past year. That's a success right there. Well, we have been in a virtual age for a long time, even pre-pandemic. And so I think this really forced everyone to figure out how that works and what it looks like. And ultimately, even when we are back in person again, everything we've learned over this past year is going to make us a more inclusive community because now we're able to offer things online and virtually for folks who maybe um, don't have access to transportation or maybe have certain disabilities that make it really difficult for them to meet in person. And so I think that's an opportunity that we should continue to provide even after we meet in person. What, what good comes out of a pandemic for a church? Um, <laughs> well, we're, we're starting to think about a time capsule for our RGL. And so that'll be fun. That'll be cool um, to look forward to and to look back at um, one of these days. Um, in general, I think that in many ways, all of us have been challenged to think outside the box, that we have gotten away from the, this is what we usually do. Um, I think that we've seen that we have the capacity to be successful with change, which mm -hmm. is really great. Um, in my area, I know that an opportunity has been to connect with parents and families in different ways. So kind of like I said before, with the various options where it's not just Sunday morning and that's where we're gonna hit people. Um, you know, before it was, okay, well, I'm doing a monthly newsletter. Well, I think that we just need to think about ways that we can keep people updated um, going forward um, so that they can take church home with them, right? So like I took this workshop one time, which I need to figure out a way to offer, but it's like, how do you know you have a Unitarian Universalist home? Well, you should certainly figure that out during a pandemic, right? Like, how do you know that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln is in your heart and not just in the building when you go there on Sunday morning? The biggest thing to me is that I think if we can successfully <clears throat> merge into a hybrid situation, <clears throat> excuse me, especially for meetings, um, things like that, I think that it'll give more people an opportunity to be involved. Um, if we are not constrained by our old ideas that all meetings had to be in person 100%, mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if we can continue to offer hybrid options, I think more people will be able to participate. It opens the door, for example, for people who have children, you know, who might be able to participate in a one hour meeting online. But if they had to add in the time to drive to the church, you know, one you know, thus making it really a two hour commitment, it might eliminate them. And, and really parents aren't the only um, people I'm thinking of. Uh, there are a lot of examples of that, but I, I really think that we, now that we've had a taste of it and offering things online, we know that some people do take advantage of that and um, that it will open the doors to more people participating in a larger number of our events. Mm -hmm. I think we've learned a lot about some of the things that are, are, are most important to us. I mean, when you lose that connection, when you lose what you're used to, it forces you to really think and calibrate about what are the aspects of your faith that are the most important to you um, personally, for the community, for those who are, you know, served and those who are not served. And for me, I mean, I, I appreciate the, introspection that that's allowed me on, on what are the parts that that I really enjoy I am not however saying that I'd like to do this again and have that I'd rather like have some some time in the church and and a little less time to think about the introspection part but uh, uh, but I have appreciated that so mm -hmm. and then the the other opportunity that I really see is and and I I, I, I sense this kind of unspoken kind of electric energy especially among artists is that when we're finally able to be out and in places, I think that it's just going to explode. Music venues, concerts, art galleries, things like that. It's kind of that situation where you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Mm -hmm. And I think people are gonna be out and doing things. And, and as part of our mission to become more of a center of culture in the community, I think we can really take advantage of that. 
That is an exciting thought. Yeah, people are going to want to see things. They're going to want to yeah. do things. And um, in, in, in kind of a different correlation, um, Ashley got on this kick of asking me three or four times a day to start a band. And she said, people are going to want to go and see music and you should start a band. And so, you know, I get home from the church. Did you start a band? Have you talked to anybody? And so there, there, and among other musicians, I feel that like people are going to go to a lot more gigs. Now they're going to try to book a lot more things. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're in it and you're doing, you know, 15, 20 gigs a month and and it's, it, it is a job and it is a grind. And now it's been taken away from us for a year. And right. so we appreciate it a lot more now that it's gone. So I, I, I think that's going to blow up. And I think that we can really, really use that to bring people into the building and to have things that benefit the city of Lincoln and hopefully beyond. Yeah. Anything else to include for this service? Um, I'm just still really grateful to be here, <laughs> to be a part of this community. Um, I think my heart has grown in so many ways during this pandemic, you know, um, I miss seeing everybody desperately. We're all going to say that we're all going to feel that, uh, but I'm really grateful to be able to connect in different ways. <sighs> uh, Let's not do this again anytime soon. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's not have another pandemic anytime soon. 